Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Sarah Cleveland. I'm the co-director of the Human Rights Institute here at Columbia Law School. And it's my privilege today to introduce a very special guest speaker, Under Secretary Sarah Sewell, who will be teaching, talking, teaching, <laughs> she will be teaching, right? Who will be discussing US and international efforts to counter violence violent extremism, particularly focusing on how human rights and good governance can help prevent terrorism. This is a talk that is being co-sponsored uh, by the Human Rights Institute, together with the Institute for the Study of Human Rights at Columbia University, the Columbia Society of International Law, and the Columbia Law School Center on Global Governance. Now, Under Secretary Sewell has held a number of illustrious positions both in government and in academia. She's a graduate of Harvard College, a former Rhodes Scholar. She held a number of important positions in the Clinton administration. She served as a senior lecturer at Harvard and director of the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at Harvard, and then returned to the Obama administration as part of the transition team, and now as Under Secretary of State for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights. She has worked extensively in the intersection between armed conflict and civilian protection. And at the State Department, she is the top person in the State Department responsible for all the State Department bureaus that address issues relating to protection of civilians, promotion of democracy, and human rights. The U.S. has been very engaged in the effort to combat violent extremism through promotion of dialogue and understanding, including uh, next week in the General Assembly session here in New York. So it's a particular privilege to have her here to speak with us today. Please join me in welcoming Under Secretary Sir. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for the warm welcome, everybody. Um, I am informed that it's not simply because you want to be at the cutting edge of a normative and operational issue that the U.S. is really helping to shape around the world. It's really because you got offered food, but <laughs> I don't take it personally. Um, but really, I want to thank Columbia University for inviting me here today. It's really a, a pleasure to be here with people like Sarah Cleveland, uh, Elazar Barkhan, Greta Moseson, and many of the other terrific faculty that you have here, it does make me miss my former life a little bit. Um, but we're here to talk about a very challenging, but I think also very hopeful and intellectually exciting issue that I invite you all to participate in and help, help it unfold in the decades ahead. And that is uh, the generational struggle to prevent violent extremism. Since 9-11, the U.S. has arrayed a broad range of counterterrorism efforts to keep Americans safe. Airport security, intelligence collection, military operations, security assistance, and community partnerships. Now, our investments have prevented another catastrophic attack on the homeland, and they've certainly degraded the Al-Qaeda core leadership. But it's inescapable that as we look around the world, we continue to see terrorist attacks and acts of violent extremism now from a more diffuse and decentralized set of actors and areas. The threat of ISIL globally highlights that while military action, border security, intelligence collection, and police work are absolutely vital parts of a comprehensive counterterrorism approach, they alone are insufficient. As Secretary Kerry said, eliminating the terrorists of today with force will not guarantee protection from the terrorists of tomorrow. No matter how many terrorists we bring to justice, those groups will replenish their ranks. We need to do more to prevent young people in particular from turning to terror in the first place. And the young people that turn to violent extremism do not exist in a vacuum. They're part of communities and families today, and then they're lured into a barbaric and nihilistic organization tomorrow. The individuals that are part of violent extremist groups have many complex, overlapping, and context-specific motives for being part of those networks. 
And as the global community, we're eager to understand why violent extremism proliferates and to develop effective solutions. Just this morning, I met with over 50 researchers, methodologists, and other experts from around the world to hear about their endeavors to use data analysis and social science to better understand terrorism and violent extremism and to improve our efforts to prevent its spread. We have much more to learn, but we've documented a range of grievances and motives that propel individuals and in some cases entire communities to join or align with terrorist actors. I found it helpful when thinking about motives which are infamously complex to think along the lines of what psychologist Abraham Maslow famously posited as a hierarchy of human needs. Maslow argued that individuals have a range of needs that must be met in priority order before people attain their greatest self-realization. And at the bottom of that pyramid, self-evidently, are the needs critical to physical survival, such as food, and shelter, and safety. And then higher up that hierarchy of need, individuals look to find love and belonging, self-esteem, and purpose. And this hierarchy of needs helps us understand, I think, why dramatically different profiles of persons can be drawn to organizations that are antithetical to what we would identify as progress and humanity. The conditions that make individuals or communities vulnerable to violent extremist recruitment, often called the push factors, prominently feature conditions like physical insecurity or the inability to provide for oneself or one's family. But even when one's lower level needs are met, social and political marginalization can impact higher order human needs, such as a valued role or purpose. This is why President Obama noted, for example, groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIL exploit the anger that festers when people feel that injustice and corruption leave them with no chance of improving their lives. Or, according to a 2015 Mercy Corps study on Afghanistan, Colombia, and Somalia, three very different cases, for many youth, narratives of grievance are animated by the shortcomings of the state itself, which is weak, venal, or violent, or all three. And young people take up the gun not because they are poor, but because they are angry. Many observers talk about ideology or religion as a form of a pull factor, as opposed to a push factor, and certainly we recognize these dimensions of violent extremism. They're absolutely central to the problem set. But rather than debating whether ideas constitute the root cause of violent extremism, we try to understand the complex interplay among a variety of factors, social, political, economic, and cultural, that combine to push or make a person vulnerable to violent extremism. And religion can be one among a number of factors that play into or otherwise inform a person's higher order needs, such as identity and purpose. At the same time, terrorist groups recruit by preying on human needs that are unmet or exploiting situations where there may be violations or abuses of human rights. And terrorist groups will continue to capitalize on local grievances and anger. And this suggests the secondary benefit of providing a better addressing the needs and grievances and providing political, economic, educational, entrepreneurial development so that people have a greater hope for a life of dignity. So the question in the violent extremism context is how do we do this? Displacing terrorism from its current position as a top global threat requires a much longer term strategy. As Secretary Kerry has said, we have to devote ourselves not just to combating violent extremism, but to preventing it. So our emerging strategy, which, uh, as Sarah mentioned, will become, I think, more evident and more public in the context of the UN General Assembly margin meeting on countering violent extremism that is combined with a session on countering ISIL, will, I hope, make more apparent how our strategy helps to do just that. We're asking three fundamental questions and we are changing the global conversation about three critical elements of violent, the violent extremism problem set. First, we are enlarging the who. We're multiplying who is involved in this work far beyond governments to empower all those who can build credible and visible alternatives to terrorism. And I'll talk about each of these in turn. Secondly, we're growing the what. We're expanding the use of non-security tools to counter violent extremism 
by better addressing grievances. And as part of that, we're also redoubling efforts to understand what activities work to keep people from being recruited and radicalized. And thirdly, we are better prioritizing the where. We're using the tools in place in a targeted way to better address grievances among those who are most vulnerable to the threat of violent extremism. And we'll see this, at the, we, we saw this begin to emerge and begin to penetrate the global conversation in February in Washington at the White House Summit to counter violent extremism, or as we refer to it because we are Washington and everything must be an acronym, CVE. And at the summit, President Obama hosted governments and global representatives from civil society, from businesses, and from faith communities from 60 countries, and included some 12 multilateral bodies. And this combination joined the usual suspects in the counterterrorism conversation who have traditionally been states. So this is a fundamental changing of the who. And it set in motion what I would call a global movement to think about the prevention aspects of the global generational struggle against violent extremism. It launched an ambitious action agenda that has governments, civil society, and the private sector all working together to do things like expand research on the drivers of violent extremism and how to address them, develop inclusive national CVE strategies, empower civil society, expand economic and political opportunity for at-risk populations, and promote human rights. This thinking has moved far beyond the proverbial Washington Beltway, prompting a remarkable pace of activities, including eight countries hosting CVE regional summits, the inception of several new global networks, and countless new actors joining the conversation, and in some cases engaging with states for the first time about a shared problem. Here in, in New York next week, President Obama will, will convene that leader's summit on countering ISIL and violent extremism. And there, stay tuned, because we'll be revealing in more specificity some of the concrete outcomes from the work since February. Our own emphasis on preventive international uh, CVE has elevated the non-security dimensions of counterterrorism to the top of that agenda, engaging us in a broader and more comprehensive conversation about terrorism. And I want to now detail what I mean by the expansion of each of the three who, what, where. On the who, Secretary Kerry said in August that our comprehensive strategy has to earn the support of religious authorities, educators, and citizens who discredit hateful doctrines and who are ready and willing to build stronger and more resilient communities. CVE is catalyzing these actors and building a network of global partners. Civil society, community and religious leaders, private sector, part of this movement, we're expanding it, we're bringing in women and youth and other at-risk at groups that often lack a public voice. Each of these stakeholders are performing different functions, bringing different perspectives, and deploying new approaches to preventing the next generation of violent extremism. The process is helping forge relationships of mutual interest, as I said, often for the first time between civil society and government. For example, we see civil society helping families advocate to their governments for better policies and stronger laws to protect youth from terrorist propaganda. When I was visiting Mombasa, Kenya earlier this year, I met with civil society representatives who explained how the CVE agenda had helped them connect with county and national government officials. Previously, there had been limited NGO government dialogue on virtually any topic, including security issues. Now, civil society activists, religious leaders, and others meet with the police to discuss how to increase transparency and accountability of security forces and how communities can contribute to trust building activities. They did, however, note that civil society often has to call the meetings. It demonstrates that shared success depends on building trust between authorities and the public. And we have to be careful to preserve the voices of those who are, who are critical when they express dissent peacefully. Operating space for youth, women, religious groups, and civil societies is absolutely vital. It has to be safeguarded so that these populations can speak their minds, organize among themselves, and bring their experiences to bear, more, uh, creating more peaceful, tolerant, and democratic societies to include CVE work. So here you see the human rights agenda of protecting the space for civil society to speak truth to power remains absolutely vital to this broader conception of who needs to be involved in CVE. 
And as we expand that who, provide platforms for them, support them in their efforts, we also have to develop the what, the what we mean when we talk about CVE efforts. We can tell you a lot about what CVE does. It helps build resilience within individuals and communities. It is proactive. It's programs, institutions, and actors who work to undermine the attraction of and the recruitment by violent extremist movements and the ideologies that promote violence has many complementary components. At times, tools like messaging and amplifying credible voices are used to expose the dead-end lies of violent extremism and to build positive alternatives such as what a future without violence would look like. In other situations, training strive or encourage better CVE policy changes among government workers, and they improve government accountability to become more responsive to citizen grievances. CVE can also involve initiatives that curb corruption and promote the rule of law so that members of marginalized communities can enjoy the same rights as members of the elite. And in other situations, it can, can include job training and expanding economic opportunities so that young people can envision a future of dignity and self-reliance. I encourage you to check out cvesummit.org to learn more about the summit agenda and to follow the process through the action agenda as it gives even more detail and meaning about the what of CVE works. There are nine elements of the agenda that came out of the February CVE White House Summit, and they're all critical elements, although they're not exhaustive, uh, of CVE work. I do want to just briefly touch on one action agenda item that I think is particularly relevant as a, as a pivot point to illuminate the importance of both highlighting civil society's role and state responsibilities. And that's agenda item number three, which is strengthening community and police force and community and security force relations. This aspect supports activities and policies to enhance security forces' respect for human rights, to build stronger relationships with the communities they protect, and when needed, to reorient their organizations, meaning the security organizations, to support community-oriented policing a different approach than is traditionally understood to be the reflex for countering terrorism. While security actions are very much needed to protect civilians from terrorists, when security forces fail to provide adequate services and adequate protection, or when they fail to respect human rights in doing so, they actually uh, act in counterproductive ways for their larger goals. Mistreatment by security forces, whether shaking down citizens for money, committing sexual violence that scars survivors and their families, create barriers of fear and resentment that make it impossible for communities and police to work together effectively against terrorism. And then all too often, violent extremists in turn exploit such abuses, capitalizing on them to fuel recruitment and radicalization. Now though progress can be slow and halting even when the problems are understood, I have been able to see positive change. In Mombasa, the same example that I discussed earlier from the civil society perspective, I met with the National Police Commissioner. He had concluded that large-scale arrests and sweeps of ethnic Somalis were not productive and could, in fact, be radicalizing. And he was working to convey the importance of and provide skills to his police force in order to abandon these practices in favor of intelligence-driven operations. And here he was initially calling the meetings, and the civil society actors responded so positively that they wanted more, and thus the dynamic where the civil society actors picked up where the police commissioner had started off in a cycle that was ultimately uh, affirmative and build trust building. There's a lot that foreign partners can do to reinforce and strengthen this kind of positive grassroots change. And this example really is, I think, a very tangible way to understand the manifestations of this broader approach to countering violent extremism. It's really critical that we engage communities. And so also as part of this, of our, the US dialogue with the Kenyan government, we communicate the importance of protecting the space for civil society in order to enable this to happen. We have worked with the Kenyan government, who as part of the, the White House summit process has developed its own national CVE strategy, in which it involved civil society actors, 
a quite remarkable development from the perspective of the history of the Kenyan government's drafting of government documents. And we look forward to it becoming a public uh, document that can then provide a blueprint for exchange with local communities about how it is actually being implemented. To turn briefly to uh, the what and the how, I think it's worth mentioning that, that the, the research analysis and evaluation is something that we desperately need because there, uh, we all know that the causes of radicalization are very complex. We have a very difficult time understanding either on a macro level or in its specific manifestations what that means for policy. Empirical information can identify the factors that we should focus most on, and it can help us see our errors more clearly to do course correction and promote new or better programming. We have a limited amount of resources that can be devoted to this problem, as enormous as this problem is. We have to be smart about it, and so we need thinking and analysis in order to make sure that the investments that we make do, in fact, pay off over time. And monitoring, evaluation, and assessment are just a crucial piece of this loop, and we're trying to uh, create networks and encourage standardization of those processes. The group that I met with just this morning is a research network with, with that as one of its goals. It's called the Resolve Network, and it will link local research and expertise to international research and expertise. So we all have to do more work in the right places with the resources that are going to be most effective how do we know where to do that? And this is really, I think, the key conceptual difference between countering violent extremism work and the prevention angle of that work and the way in which it differs from what we think of as mainstream human rights work or mainstream development work, um, the work that goes on quite apart from the CVE agenda. The task of, of preventing, I should say parenthetically at the beginning, the task of preventing individual radicalization in a Western European country will look very different from how those same countries might use their foreign assistance programs and their, their foreign relations to try to prevent violent extremism in other countries abroad. Um, and the processes of individual versus community radicalization as well as the types of interventions that you use for them will differ dramatically. But when we think about using foreign assistance, when we think about using international development tools, the big muscle movements that really are going to have sort of the mass and the scale that we need to begin to address this problem, we have to be able to identify the places that could next metastasize into the chaos that breeds terrorism. We have to be thinking to how to improve and invest in those communities because by the time terrorism is full-blown and a country is in full-bore conflict, that prevention opportunity is lost. And we all know, although it's a very hard piece to execute in international policy or in domestic policy, that prevention is a sound investment. So we want to be pushing toward the prevention side of the agenda, and we want to be looking particularly at those areas that are close to active terrorist conflict, where populations are vulnerable to the spread of violent extremism, and looking at the places that are upstream where preventative efforts can have an impact before there has been large-scale radicalization and recruitment or before active conflict has moved in. This is why CVE is not the same as development or nation building writ large. It, the a research agenda is absolutely critical here. In some cases, it's more apparent to, uh, to local actors or to states themselves where those vulnerabilities are. In other cases, only careful analysis and looking behind labels and assumptions can help us make the best investments. But we in the United States are beginning to try to apply this CVE framework of prioritized investment in the most vulnerable communities uh, in a new way. And we're doing this with our foreign assistance programming of our own, as well as with how we partner with other governments and international financial institutions, the philanthropic community, the private sector, and non-government organizations as well. So to summarize overall, the US and its partners are one, working with a broader array of global partners where we've extended the, expanded the notion of partnerships to include people who are not states, institutions that are not states, and, and institutions that have very different perspectives in many cases from states. We are two, increasing activities that address grievances, the root causes and the push factors that um, have long been 
understood to be an element of the uh, violent extremist, spread of violent extremism, but have not always been the focus at scale of our efforts. And three, we're doing this in the places that are most vulnerable to extremism before they are infected with a cancer that is, by definition, uh, very difficult to root out without a much bigger investment and a much more kinetic investment. We believe that this broader CVE agenda, that the focus on prevention represents the best opportunity to shrink the numbers of those who are drawn to the fight, and it can better prevent the rise of a violent extremist movement that could become the next ISIL. Closing terrorist actors take innocent lives every day, and governments face real challenges in both responding effectively and avoiding counterproductive responses. And we continue to see disturbing reports of civilian casualties from state counterterrorism operations. We see overreach of regulations in the name of counterterrorism that are used against members of political opposition. We see systematic profiling of members of certain minorities. We in the United States have and continue to grapple with these issues in our own policies and actions. The framing of CVE is fundamentally important. The way we are moving to frame this issue is fundamentally positive and proactive activity to meet a generational challenge. It offers the greatest opportunity to both help change state behavior and reduce the number of supporters of terrorist behavior. It is helping achieve international stability in ways that may not seem reflexive and obvious to states. It is a hugely important expansion of a conversation. And so as we return to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, CDE moves our counterterrorism response closer to promoting human rights and human needs. And our work on CVE reinforces that respecting, protecting, and promoting human rights enhances long-term security. Violating rights in the name of security too often backfires and feeds the cycle of terrorism. So within a human rights framework, some roles for meeting, some roles for meeting needs are for governments, some roles are best left outside of governments. But in both cases, governments have to be part of a holistic solution, and at a minimum, they cannot fuel the growth of violent extremism. Good governance and human rights are critical for protecting communities and individuals from the false promises of violent extremism. Now, we know that sustaining and amplifying CVE efforts will take patience, resources, and commitment. But I'd like to just close with the Obama uh, administration's CVE approach as characterized by Secretary Kerry. It's one that can send a clear signal to the next generation that its future will not be defined by the agenda of terrorists and the violent ideology that sustains them. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, and for enlightening us on uh, this aspect of the effort to combat terrorism. I think that the the efforts on the other end of the spectrum, lethal targeting, detention, get so much attention and so many resources. Um, I'd be curious if you could comment on how you persuade domestic actors and international actors that you have the tangible benefits from these type of preventive efforts to get the kinds of resources committed that you need. And I, and I ask this simply because the problem it has always struck me with lethal targeting and detention is that you have concrete outcomes that are measurable in perhaps perverse but concrete. clear <laughs> terms, right? And the, and the externalities that are created, the radicalization that results from that activity is not measured. Right, and so you only see what is considered the positive and you don't see the negative. And you're, tr you're trying to grapple with the unmeasurable and I would love to hear your thoughts on that. And then we'll open it to questions. Great, no, it's a great question. And I will say parenthetically that this is something that, um, that is not unique to this field, right? So one of the other hats that I wear is um, seeking to make the department work more effectively on prevention in the realm of atrocities that are unrelated to terrorism. And again, we have the same issue that we have of, of demonstrating the foul that's been avoided, demonstrating the crisis that didn't happen, and trying to you know, infer causality from what can only be seen as correlation. It's, it's a problem much more broadly. Here, as you note, 
um, the 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 desire to be able to do something that one can concretely see, whether it's the movement of equipment or the dropping of a bomb, is completely understandable as a response to the, the kinds of depravities that terrorists routinely commit. And I think we are early yet in our ability to demonstrate concretely what this broader approach will mean. One of, frankly, the intellectual vulnerabilities of this argument is that because we have not prioritized this type of approach, we don't have the empirical evidence that demonstrates the effectiveness or the ineffectiveness of this type of approach. And so we felt rather brave in having as a major outcome of the White House Summit on Countering Violent Extremism this first point, which is we need more research to better understand what causes this problem and how we can best address it. That is, in many ways, being intellectually honest at the potential risk of being uh, less effective in terms of the policy arena. But it's absolutely critical that we, because, because even if this becomes much more prioritized, the problem set right now is absolutely enormous. And so it seems very much at both intellectually honest and tactically essential in terms of being able to prioritize work that we spend more time at the front end understanding the problem and understanding the correct interventions. We have a lot of evidence of how individual problems affected individuals. What we don't have is any sense of how these, these can be translated into, a, into broader global interventions, nor do we have great confidence that we can always initially do that diagnosis initially with the communities and, and be able to uh, immediately adjust over time. In other words, avoiding the foul takes time to accrue the empirical evidence. So the short answer to your question is that in the same way that we say, well, you know, we don't really know what will necessarily work to uh, rehabilitate someone, to send them back into society, but we're going to try or we may not know all the right preventive health investments that will make our society healthier, but we have some instincts and some evidence, we'll go with that because we know it's really important to get it right. There is to some degree an experimental aspect early on. What we were talking about at the research conference is the importance of stories. So the reason that I give the Mombasa example is because A, it has that Kissingerian added advantage of being true. I've seen it with my own eyes. But B, it's something that is, that, is, that is concrete enough that people can leave saying there is reason for hope that this can get better. And so I think to some extent we need to create platforms and we need to create an expectation that, that success at the community level is something that is germane to the broader fight and something that we need to be talking about when we talk about counterterrorism as an integral part of that discussion. And so I think it takes time. It's part of the reason why I'm so excited about the UN General Assembly side event, because it's when you hear from these local researchers. It's when we, you hear from governments that are experimenting and doing things differently. It's when you hear the, the tangible stories about how trust is built and how you know somebody's child didn't go somewhere that you can begin to to connect people with those stories, but in terms of empirical evidence, we have a ways to go. And what I will say parenthetically is that, is that as someone who has now watched the distinction between academic research that is done about what is beneficial and what is not in the policy realm and the ways in which policy decisions are made, I would argue that there is not always a strong correlation between what the empirical evidence demonstrates and what we do. And so, I don't mean to suggest that the empirical evidence isn't important, but what I do mean to suggest is that for those who understand the, the limits of our current approach, which has been confined in large part to one end of the spectrum, as we look for solutions, we ought to be demanding that we try other things, even if it takes a while for the empirical evidence to show us precisely what other things work. So it's a great example, I think, as someone who, who used to teach uh, graduate students how to learn about the realities of the policy process without giving, hope, giving up hope about one's ability to change the policy process. I think it's a great example of where we're at a very interesting intersection in terms of really broadening the aperture of a problem definition and broadening the potential for solutions even if we haven't arrived at a silver bullet 
and oh, by the way, I don't think there ever will be a silver bullet, but I think it's a really interesting moment. And this question of do you just mobilize pressure for the change or do you amass the empirical evidence for the change, I think you want to do both. Great. Okay, we're um, Under Secretary Sewell has graciously agreed to take some questions and we have a few minutes, so let's Well, policy um, process in government is something that if I, if I were too detailed about it, I would be in really big trouble. Um, but I think what's fair to say is that it's constantly evolving. And I, and I, and I say as someone who, um, who in a previous life before I joined government worked to, on the campaign of uh, then candidate uh, Barack Obama, if you go to his very first speech given at the Wilson Center uh, on, on counterterrorism, you will see in it this, the, his commitment uh, to a comprehensive approach. And you will see in it the complexity of his understanding of the, the, what, what was then seen as a simply an al-Qaeda fight, the complexity of his understanding about what it would take to defeat al-Qaeda. And now, of course, we have a much more complex fight. As I've said, it's very disaggregated now. Daesh has a completely different sort of MO than al-Qaeda did. Um, Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, I mean, the number of groups that are using, in many cases, sort of insurgency tactics uh, to, to hold territory and attempt to govern and to mobilize entire communities with a variety of different levers and aims um, has only made the need for a comprehensive approach more pressing. So the policy tends to go, you know, policy tends to look for solutions that are concrete and immediate, and it tends to use the tools that are best resourced and most easily directed. One of the things that is, I think, inescapably true about prevention work in general, but also about CVE, is that, as I've described it, it's much more complicated. It's much more complicated to, to engender as a policy a set of activities on the part of people you don't control. We don't control civil society in Tanzania or in Mali. Uh, we, don't, we don't control uh, those governments who have, uh, you know, key decisions to make about how they want to try to attack that. And so for, for the United States, the evolution of our policy is partly looking at the way the threat has evolved on the ground and recognizing what we are doing that has an impact and what still needs to be addressed. And as we've seen the continued expansion of terrorism, we are recognizing the need to try broader approaches to be more inclusive, to be more preventive, to be more proactive, to work earlier on the agenda because we have to contain the threat in order for the hard security tools to work. So it's a gradual process that comes from um, both the structures that you have for decision making and the tools that you have for addressing a problem as leavened by actual experience with the success of your policies. And so I think the notion that we need to engage the globe in what, in my view, is fundamentally an attack on the very values and norms that have been built imperfectly, but built importantly, critically, since World War II to essentially uh, honor individual dignity and enhance the, the, the stability of the world by giving people voice in their government, you know, all of that is under threat by this violent extremist spread. And so we need to engage everyone who has a stake in that other reality of stability and rights to be part of the solution. And we haven't engaged everybody yet. And I think this is really a critical moment of the United States seeking to build a broader coalition that goes beyond the fight against Daesh, beyond the fight against terrorism more narrowly defined, and really asks every element that can come into play to, to essentially preserve the values and the order that we have been looking at and doing so in a way that hinges fundamentally on individual and community resilience. So the evolution of policy is, is something that happens because we have certain approaches and then they are leavened by the experience that we have with, with their application.
No, great. We need to link you into the research network because that's the conversation we had this morning. Um, and so the, the answer to your question is that, that part of what is what we really emphasize, what the president emphasized in the White House Summit on Countering Violent Extremism, is that violent extremism comes in many forms. And religion is only one cut, as I think I said in the, the, the remarks, one cut of what can be motivating uh, a group or an individual to violent extremist ideology. One of the interesting things about, well, two things. So first of all, the, the White House Summit, when, we, when the participants were talking about violent extremism, very explicitly including examples that were not uh, just the ones that I happened to mention, simply because those are the countries that I happen to have been to lately and seen uh, in action. But the, the 969 movement in Burma, or uh, Sendero Luminoso, or um, the, the, the Norwegians, when they had their regional conference, their national touchstone for violent extremism has nothing to do either with a group and a network, nor does it have to do with anything relating to religion per se. It had to do with, you know, a, essentially a white nationalist supremacist. So the, the, the critical element of what constitutes a global movement is that they are global threats and they do not come in the form of any single ideology, any single religion. And it's precisely because we have not only historical examples that may give us insights into particularly community mobilization as opposed to individual recruitment, but we also have a variety of other analogs from which we can learn. So for example, uh, the ways in which gangs penetrate and sustain st penetrate communities and sustain themselves has some exam has some lessons for the violent extremist the community resilience piece of the violent extremist movement. So the the use of the term violent extremism has been has been criticized for being uh, for not specifying that Islam is at its center, but it's a very conscious choice to use this broader framing, and um, and I. I think that it is, what is really fascinating is to see the, I think we'll have some, some statistics to share in the, uh, at the UN um, side meeting. If you look at the paths to radicalization, even of Americans, uh, the, 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 the diffusion of the profiles of people who are becoming radicalized really belies the fact that, um, that there is a single, uh, a single root or a single religion. So it's, it's purposefully and consciously broad and inclusive. About Syria, I, I looked at another country about Syrian government. About Syrian government as a, rose, uh, as a, a root cause of the terrorism. I mean, you spoke about the, bu the Bush factors, but you didn't mention that sometimes policy, one of the Bush factors, the outcome of the Obama administration led to ISIS. I think you have many research in your administration that state the outcome of Assad attacking or barrel bombs created ISIS. And we, we didn't see as a Syrian, I am one of 10 millions dis who displaced out the country. We fled because of the uh, American inaction. I mean, supporting the terrorism, it's not just by pay, like paying money, donating for them. It is by just ignoring them 
and that's what's happened in Syria. I know CVE, it is like long-term plan, but I mean, I wish we have like a short-term plan to defeat that current terrorism in Syria. It's not about like the last statistic, ISIS last month killed maybe 50 civilians, beheaded them by knife, but the barrel bombs killed more than thousands of civilians. So I wish like you could uh, deliver this message to the administration that the root cause uh, of terrorism in Syria is Assad regime. Thank you. Thanks. Um, well, first of all, I think it's important to note that the United States is not responsible for Assad's barrel bombs. I just, for the record, want to clarify that. And second of all, you know, the United States is is fundamentally seized with the problems of the Assad regime. I think the 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 core point is that the the observation that you make that the behavior of the state can engender violent extremism supports everything that I have just been talking about. And it is the added dimension or an added dimension of a broader approach toward looking at the causes and solutions to violent extremism that is precisely where we need to go on a preventive level. As I said before, once conflict has taken hold and once terrorist activities are integrated into a particular society, you're talking, you can't be talking about prevention anymore. It's too late for prevention. Then you're talking about response. That's a different topic than, this, than the CVE policy. But I think your fundamental point, which is that governance matters and that the abuse of civilians can engender armed resistance and that ultimately terrorists can take advantage of and flourish in that kind of an environment, is fundamentally congruent with the point that I'm making. So thank you for your comment. Uh, well, for the most part, um, when, we, when we as the United States government are partnering with a civil society organization, we're doing so with uh, a knowledge of who this organization is, who is involved in it, and what their goals are, and we would only be working with them if we felt that they were uh, committed to rule of law, you know, settling their, their grievances through peaceful means, and a variety of other safeguards. Um, the, the broader point about how civil society can be mobilized exists regardless. I mean, it's, it's an extent, it's a, it's a pre-existing problem, and it, it is bro both broader than how, how it applies to CVE or not. I think that the, the framework for CVE and the engagement of civil society is, is that the civil society actors are interested in protecting the values that are at risk by terrorism. And so in that regard, I think that is a, a lens through which there is every reason to expect that those who engage in CVE are doing so with a commitment to the rule of law and nonviolence. So I think your broader question about the role of civil society and how individuals can mobilize themselves is quite distinct from the CVE lens. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes. Sorry, can you wait for the mic? Hi. Um, I would actually want to ask a similar question to what he asked, because you talk about the factors that aided in the radicalization within the Middle East, particularly like in Iraq and Syria, and you don't mention the U.S. invasion of Iraq, and I was just curious what you thought about that. Well, I'm a government official, um, and so I'm gonna stick to what I came here to talk about, which is the, the countering violent extremism policy as it has evolved since I joined government about a year and a half ago. 
Um, and I think that the, the question about whether or not actions of the state or actions by states are radicalizing is a really important question and a really valid question, and it needs very much to be integrated into how we think about the, the growth and spread of violent extremism. I think that that is exactly why this avenue, this perspective, this aperture is so fundamentally important and has the potential to be transformative in the way we do problem identification and think about second and third order consequences of our actions. Um, this, is, this is a global conversation that has really formed since February. So I would invite you to give it some time and to engage with it because I think that it will, uh, like any uh, new conceptual frame or expanded conceptual frame, will require time to be tested. And it will never be perfectly applied in the same way that you know, we are always, uh, I think many of us, impatient that the human rights framework doesn't seem to be evident everywhere that we look. Um, that doesn't mean that having international conventions and national laws about human rights don't have value and don't fundamentally transform the options and choices that are made and the realities for people on the ground. So, um, you know, you're not the, the, I have had many conversations with people who sort of say, well, gosh, it's been since February and we still have violent extremism. We, this, is, this is early, these are early days and this is a really important shift and right now I think the challenge for us all is to make sure that this broader conception of who is engaged, what are the questions that we're asking, what are the methods that we use and how do we evaluate our success, I think we're gonna need some time to, to make sure that this is institutionalized and lives and it's gonna be imperfect for a while. I mean, this is, this is in some sense the bravery of saying the research agenda is number one on our list of action items. These are early days. I would argue that these are very important days and that it is extraordinary to have had at the White House summit a number of key states that are concerned with terrorism for the first time sitting in a room where civil society also has a seat sort of at the same level around the room. And they're hearing a very different dialogue about what the causes of violent extremism in their country are. This, this is gonna take time um, both to give it full form and to embed it in habits and to really see, see the, the lasting impact. And so um, I say that, and I don't mean to be defensive. I mean, I think this is, this is, you know, if you're not going with the hard security tools where you know that you've dropped the bomb, this is the world that you have to live in. And the question is whether this is a more fruitful way to move towards sustaining the kinds of values and stability that I think were so hard won and carefully assembled post-World War II, can we sustain them in a modern form in the 21st century in the face of this threat? And I think that all the skepticism is, is absolutely warranted and invited, but let's channel it into making things um, more effectively work on the prevention side. We have a hard stop at 10 past, so I think we have time for one more question.
Sorry, yes. Yeah, and therefore, are, are we really going towards the Bell I, thanks for the question. I would certainly not want to be understood as arguing that this is sort of a stalking horse for democratization. Um, the question of inclusiveness can be, uh, as, a, as, a, as a vulnerability for a community, can be understood in a variety of ways. It can be economic, it can be political, it can be social. And the solution for inclusiveness is not always uh, one particular form of governance. So that's, I think, a really critical point. Um, I think that the the question of how we would, how one would diagnose the vulnerabilities and address the vulnerabilities is so context specific. What I can say in a case like Kenya, that is a very robust democracy, they have huge issues, they are related to marginalization, and they are not purely a function of political exclusion. So it, it's, it's, it is very context specific, and it may well be that you could have a, a, a reduction in all kinds of vulnerable, vulnerabilities for a particular community be reducing the threat that individuals or communities would be uh, drawn to violent extremism and still retain huge deficits in terms of political inclusion. So there's not, it's, there is no monocausality and there, there is no singular solution that relates to addressing the particulars. I do not think that and, and this is the point that I was trying to make vis-a-vis -vis Syria or any country in which there's active conflict or in which there is no state and there is significant terrorist penetration. This kind of thinking presupposes that there is a, a, a degree of uh, ability to operate in that environment by civil society, i.e. a relative reduced conflict, that it's not an area of active conflict, and it presumes that there is, in many cases, a government that wants to solve the problem and that can begin to um, become more conscious of second and third order impacts where that is, con where they are convinced that those become ultimately self-defeating. So I don't, I, there's only a degree to which the, the, um, the problems are, CVE is not made to address the problems where you know, like Assyria. That's, that's not what it's for. That is where, as the administration has said, they will be engaged in trying to build up the, the, the opposition. They are engaged in um, military activities. They are engaged in a host of things. It's a different, a different set. So in terms of low-hanging fruit, I think that there are, there are so many opportunities to do really important, creative, and potentially impactful CVE work in such a wide variety of countries. And we've seen this through the different regional summits. So where you've got a Kazakhstan, you know, again, figuring out how it's gonna bring civil society into its national action plan, you know, that's, that's really important. Is it singularly enough? Is it sustainable? We don't know, but it's important. And I think, you know, f from a Kazakhstan to a Norway to, a, to Astana, you're gonna see all of these different variations. The, 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 the big, principles that I've outlined in terms of it's more inclusive, it's more preventive, it's dealing with root causes, and it's targeted to the places that we, where we think communities or individuals are most vulnerable, really are at this point as macro-threaded as one can be without making assumptions or oversimplifying the problem set in terms of how we would work on it in a particular case. And I think that's part of what makes it very challenging to talk about and it's part of the reason why people say, oh, it's too abstract, or they say, oh, it's too big and complicated, or they say, oh, you know, there, there are a lot. So we're trying to really focus, and this, again, is what the research conference was about. How do we take the big things that we know are different about this approach and equip different sets of actors and constellations of coalitions to come up with their own specific diagnoses and solution sets? So the, the fact that it is not bundled neatly is not, in my mind, a, uh, a weakness. It is a reality that comes whenever one is trying to re-envision how to approach a problem that is not particularly well understood or transparent. And so I think we do have an interesting road ahead of us, and I certainly hope that many of you students and possibly faculty will be helping to contribute to both embed it into the whoop and wharf of international politics and to make it more effective and have a, a greater impact on the world that you want to live in when you grow older. So thank you. Thank you very much.
Well, I would like to thank the Under Secretary for enlightening us and for reminding us that you can understand the policy process and still have hope, uh, particularly with respect to what seems to be a very intractable, intractable problem. So we will all look forward to what unfolds next week and to the progress of your efforts. Thank you very much.